Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We continue today our series on characters of the cross, and today we're going to look at what I call the fickle crowd. And as we do that, we're going to open up with the story of John the Baptist again, as we did last week, but a different take. So let's hear what Luke has to say in chapter 3. Beginning with the 15th verse, he says, The interest of the people by now was building. They were all beginning to wonder, could this John be the Messiah? But John quickly intervened, I'm baptizing you here in the river. The main character in the drama, to whom I am mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life, a fire, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. As we talked about John last week and we found out the profoundness of John's words hurt Jesus more than they may have helped him in the sense of how the Pharisees and those looked at him. But today, it's the preparation for him to begin to have a crowd to follow Jesus. We can surmise that John here paved the way for Jesus to have followers by what he informs his followers about the coming of Jesus. John informs his crowd that if you think I'm all that, just wait, you ain't seen nothing yet. He is letting his crowd know that Jesus is all that and a bag of chips. John was truly the perfect prophet to prepare the way for the Lord. John knew exactly who he was. And I repeat that John knew exactly who he was and the role he was playing. John didn't have an identity crisis. He knew what God was using him for. John wasn't worried about who was the greater or lesser than in the story of God. He was busy just doing what God needed him to do. Even though he was the older cousin for Jesus, he didn't let that get in the way of who he was with Jesus. He had no bearing on the role of their age. It didn't matter to John. He just knew that he had to prepare the people to be ready for the kingdom of God and the message that Jesus is going to bring. You might say John had a healthy self-esteem that we could learn from. There is so much we can learn from John on how he was more than ready to pass the baton of leadership to his younger cousin, Jesus. And I want you to hear this clearly. He is not only ready, willing, and able. John is eager and excited about the prospect of passing the baton to Jesus. I think this is critical to our story because it tells so much about who John is. That John's attitude is primary for his audience and crowd to hear what he is saying. As Jesus begins his ministry in the region of Galilee and Capernaum, They've already heard John talk about Jesus and what Jesus is going to bring to the people. Take a look at the words that John uses to promote who Jesus is. He says, Jesus will ignite the kingdom light. He will set you on fire by the Holy Spirit within you in order to ignite the kingdom light. He will change you from the inside out. He's going to clean house. He will make a clean sweep of your lives. And most of all, he'll place everything true in its proper place. Can we all say, wow? Now that's a glowing letter of recommendation coming from John preparing the people for, for Jesus. John has provided the words of inspiration and of hope for his followers to easily transition from following John to following Jesus. John has done a tremendous job of providing Jesus the support of supporters to walk with him as he sets out to change the world one person at a time. Which leads me to our next story about Jesus feeding the thousands in Mark's gospel. It's entitled, A Meal for 4,000. And Mark writes it this way in chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. At about this time, Jesus again found himself with a hungry crowd on his hands. He called his disciples together and said, This crowd is breaking my heart. They have stuck with me for three days, and now they have nothing to eat. Some of them have come a long distance. If we wait too long and they try to leave, they'll faint along the way. We need to do something. In this text, I got to thinking. It sounds like a party, doesn't it? Did Jesus have a party in the wilderness? When I have read and heard this story and told, I've always been stuck, struck by the vastness 
of the people who were present on this hill, some 4,000 people. As I was preparing for today, I thought it in a slightly different light for the first time. I thought it as a party, and Jesus sees himself as the host of this grand party in the wilderness. Then the disciples are basically his hired hands, his hired workers, to assist him to make sure that all his guests are satisfied. This is some party. For Mark tells us that not only is it a party, but it's been going on for three days. Now that's what I call a party of parties. But we, we now hear that Jesus is concerned for all those who have gathered and is wondering, are they hungry? And Jesus has deducted that a majority of the folks who have been there have seen their food rations diminished over the time because they're there longer than they had planned. Three days, it says. They have become so mesmerized by Jesus' words that they forgot about their basic necessities. Food! Jesus, noticing this, having compassion on all who had gathered, he calls a staff meeting of his disciples and says, Look, the people are starving. We need to feed them. At which point, I just love the disciples here. They must look at Jesus in disbelief and basically want to say to him, Excuse me, Jesus? I love, we love your wonderful compassion response and a real need, uh, meeting the needs of the people because they're hungry, but um, have you forgotten where we are, Jesus? We are in the middle of nowhere. I repeat, nowhere, Jesus. We're in the middle of nowhere. We are miles from the nearest Salmart. Yet Jesus looks at his disciples and basically says, I've got this. I've got this. And he proceeds to ask him, who has bread? How many loaves do we have? And do we have any fish? Now, the disciples again probably look at Jesus kind of great and wondering if he's lost his mind. And they say, Oh, Jesus, we have, we have, um, we have seven loaves and um, some fish. They're probably thinking to themselves, Really, Jesus? Like, this is going to resolve the problem? But needless to say, Jesus, upon hearing the news of seven, of seven loaves and some fish gathered together, he says, okay, everybody, please sit down, have a seat, please make yourself comfortable. And he proceeds to break bread and, and break fish with them, and he shares it with the multitude. And, and the text says, not only did he share all that he had, but when he had, everybody was satisfied and filled, everyone in the crowd. But not only that, the text tells us that they were satisfied, but they had seven bags of food left over. Now, when you think about it, when Jesus throws a party, he knows how to throw a party. If you look at what he's done, he's not only fed the people, but they were satisfied, and there were leftovers to feed all those whom they might see along the journey after this party. Wow. The text said that there were 4,000 plus gathered. Can you imagine how the crowd became even more inflated after the ultimate party in the wilderness when they saw what Jesus was able to do? Jesus was truly delivered on the word that John had proclaimed about him. He was beginning to change people from the inside out by his engaging and energizing words, but also by his actions, by his compassion and his empathy and his hospitality. The excitement of the crowd was buzzing and building. They were following in the droves of Jesus. And this would be Jesus' ministry for the first two and a half years, maybe almost close to three. And then things would begin to shift. We're going to see one of those shifts in one of the great stories in, our, in the Bible, in the story of Zacchaeus. In Luke chapter 19, he writes it this way when Jesus comes into Jericho. He says, And then Jesus entered and walked through Jericho, and there was a man there. His name was Zacchaeus, the head tax man, and quite rich. He wanted to desperately see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way, and he was quite short and couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed, and climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see what Jesus and who Jesus was as he came by. No more had he gotten in the tree and into his position that Jesus arrived. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry on down. Today is the day to be, I am to be a guest in your home. I find this story so intriguing and also a major shift in what's going on in the Gospels. Human nature, I find, is quite interesting. I think we can all probably say that. 
For one minute, people are all behind you, and the next thing you know, they're against you. And as we look at this story and how it sees its way through, we see the whole transformation of the people going from and for Jesus to some going against it's a great story, though, as we read the story. It's a great story of God's redemptive love for the least of these. Once again, Jesus is doing what John said he would do. He is changing people from the inside out. That's exactly what he does for Zach. Jesus flips the script in Zach's life. Jesus not only transforms the life of Zach, but also those gathered at his house for dinner that night. But there is a twist. And where, where the crowd now starts, some of them begin to become fickle on Jesus. As much as they wanted to follow Jesus and watch him do the amazing things he was doing, their acceptance of Jesus was conditional. I want you to hear that. Their acceptance of Jesus was conditional. And I don't think it's any different today about how we see Jesus, but that's for you to decide. But what I mean is that when Jesus was doing all the cool things, feeding all the people, doing, taking care of the miracles, healing people. That was great, and that was wonderful, but there was a point at which that wasn't so wonderful, that wasn't so cool, you might say. As long as Jesus didn't cross the line and not accept those who were culturally unacceptable, as long as he didn't engage with those unacceptable people, it was fine. But you see, I think in this case, as we draw close to Jerusalem in the final days of Jesus, Zach, as Lazarus was last week for the religious leaders, Zach was a deal breaker for some of the crowd. Here in Luke's Gospel, it is Jesus daring not only to welcome Zacchaeus and include him in the reclamation project in the Galilean Jerusalem districts, but Jesus does the unthinkable again. He invites himself to Zacchaeus' home and sits down to have dinner with Zach and his other friends. They called them sinners, or we also know them better as the IRS agents of the day, the tax collectors. Therefore, they were probably public enemy number one in the eyes of the Hebrew people because they were taking their money. But just listen to their response at the end of this text. It says that everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumbled. And they said, what business does Jesus have getting cozy with this crook or crooks, if you include all the other tax collectors? And once again, the fitness hit the shan. And just like with the Pharisees, some in the crowd are beginning to turn on Jesus. His actions are seen as reprehensible. The question becomes with those in the crowd who are disgusted with Jesus opening up the kingdom to the undesirables. Those tax collectors, man, that's terrible. So you begin to ask the question, will they cheer Jesus or will they jeer Jesus when he enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey? How quickly the crowd can become fickle. Which takes us to our next slide of Jesus entering into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And John writes it this way. And the next day, the huge crowd that had arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jerusalem. They broke off palm branches and went out to meet him. And as they cheered, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But in verses 17 and 19, it begins to shift. And the crowd that had been with him when he had called Lazarus from the tomb, raising him him from the dead was there giving eyewitness accounts. It was because they had spread the word of his latest God sign that the crowd swelled to overwhelming parade. The Pharisees took one look and threw up their hands. It's out of control. The world's in a stampede after Jesus. As we reflect on the text, and as I alluded to in the previous text, the question becomes who was cheering and who was jeering Jesus? Following the events in Jericho's house, the event of Jesus raising Lazarus and Bethany also had taken place. And the crowd is now comprised of those who were enthralled with Jesus, as we hear it in this text so clearly. They were definitely cheering, but there, then there were those who weren't so sure what to do with Jesus. On the hand, other hand, there were those who were confused as to who Jesus was. They were unsure of who Jesus was. They may have become frustrated with Jesus even angry that he was bringing in so many undesirables into this new kingdom of God. With Jesus' actions being what they were, the things he was saying, the things he was doing, and maybe now because the religious leaders were present in the midst of this crowd, maybe 
they were beginning to have influence on those who were unsure what to do with Jesus because of their own pride. Prejudice were getting, beginning to urse within them. And we know that the text, the Pharisees were there waiting to pounce on an opportunity. They were looking for an opportunity during the Passover to do something. And since they were there in the story, I began to wonder if they weren't listening, if they weren't watching, waiting, looking for those in the crowd, looking for those in the crowd who might just have an ounce of question about Jesus. And they're looking for an opportunity to influence them. And for them, maybe some of the fire that John had talked about had begun to cool because of what Jesus was doing, by what Jesus was saying. Maybe some of Jesus' approval rating may have begun to wane among all the things that he had been doing. If it can happen for political leaders, it definitely can happen to Jesus. And given the fact that there are some in the crowd who may have begun to sour on Jesus as he entered Jerusalem, we begin to see something happen. Now the religious leaders have a door open for those who are beginning to sway in how they saw Jesus. Now they can get, could begin to hatch their plot to kill Jesus if they could just get a few. They probably realized that all they needed was a few who were turning on Jesus. That they could use those who were wavering on their support of Jesus as pawns in their plot to kill him. They could manipulate those wavering to impact those who were more loyal to Jesus by a rumor or innuendo. Which leads to our final slide. Part of the story of Jesus before the crowd and Pilate. In Matthew's text, Jesus talks, he talks about the arrest of Jesus. And listen to the words of Jesus here. Then Jesus addressed the mob. He says, what is this? Coming out after me with swords and clubs as if I were a dangerous criminal? Day after day, I've been sitting in the temple teaching. And you never so much as lifted a hand against me. You've done it this way to confirm and fulfill the prophetic writings. And when the disciples heard this, they cut away and ran. Wow. As I have worked through this series on the characters of the cross, today's text has really gotten my attention. How about you? As I follow my own progression of the text I, that I've looked at over these last few weeks, I have to stop and really think about who is the crowd? Who is the crowd? In the previous weeks, I've had, had an, able, an opportunity to grasp who all those characters were. And, and even next week, I, I can grasp who Pilate is. But today, I have to take a step back. I can't speak for all of you, but I have to speak for myself. More than any of all the characters we have looked at, there is much more here. There's a certain onus and identity recognition here for myself, at least. As I wrote the message, literally, I had to stop and think. It hit me with these four words. I am the crowd. I am the crowd. I am the crowd. And I began to question myself, how, do, how dare I say that I am any different from the crowd in Jerusalem? If I were to place myself in a time machine and set myself back in 33 ADE, what would prevent me from listening and aligning myself with the religious leaders? What would stop me from welcoming the gossip about Jesus as it, as it, as it worked its way through the crowd as the trial was taking place before them? How would I be any less judgmental regarding Jesus daring to eat with tax collectors, forgiving the sins of the most undesirable, raising Lazarus from the dead, going to dinner at Zach's house? What would make me any less jealous of the relationship that Jesus had with Mary and, and Martha and Lazarus? Or how offended would I have been not to be included in the group of disciples that Jesus chose? 
Or how would I be any less tempted than Judas, knowing that I wasn't part of Jesus' inner circle of James, Peter, and John? There is so much at play, folks. There is so much at play as to why and how the crowd that loved Jesus could turn on him and become fickle. Yet, two centuries, two, two millenniums later, we, we, we are the privilege to know the end of the story. And we can profess, because of what we know, that we wouldn't be in the crowd jeering at Jesus, screaming vehemently, crucify him! But as for me, sadly, I believe as I wrote this, and as I share it with you now, I can't say that I wouldn't respond any differently to than the crowd chanting, crucify him. Let me give you an example, a real example. A number of months ago, my daughter came to me, Danielle, and she said to me, will you march with me in the Black Lives Matter march in Hollywood? And I said, yes. Didn't give it a thought, just knew that I believed in much of the cause of the Black Lives Matter and still do. And as we walked those streets with tens of thousands of people around us, and we were ended up in the front of the march of all places. And much of what they were chanting in the megaphones, I agreed with, with all my heart, found myself chanting along with them those things I believed in. But then certain things were being said and chanted that I disagreed with vehemently. And reality set in, and sadly, and I think regrettably, I fell silent and saddened by what was being said that said nothing. And I see that that situation wasn't so much different than the crowd gathered in Jerusalem chanting, crucify him. How many in the crowd may have been quiet like me? Not saying anything or rebuffing what was being said against Jesus, but going along with the crowd. Maybe not sharing and shouting and chanting, crucify him. But neither were they protesting and stopping him or standing up. So I ask you, and I ask myself, before we condemn the crowd, which we so often want to do for saying, crucify him, how could you? I ask you now, as I've asked myself, to own who you are before Jesus. I realize that it isn't that hard to be fickle on Jesus. So, <clears throat> what's on your lips? What's on your lips? What's on your lips? 